Yeah. If there's any um, thing you don't understand, please do interrupt me. I'm happy for interruption. I'll let you know when I can um, when I can stop. So let's just get straight into it. Greetings to everyone again. Glad to see everyone here. I see a couple of BCM family. God bless you. Thank you for coming on. Let's go. So perspective. So let's just start with an introduction. This week is going to be mainly an introduction into the topic. And then in the coming weeks, we will get also there'll be other people who will be jumping on to to take the lead on this for example when we get into further down the line we'll be having a perspective on living with sickness or having a perspective on living as a saved single mother so we're going to get into a lot of things but this week we're just going to get into the introduction of what of the subject so perspective is the way that one looks at something a particular view or outlook the way in which we we view a person or a thing is so powerful that it can alter our destiny. Before I forget, you don't have to read along. This is mainly for me. If you want to read along, that's up to you. You might see a lot of spelling mistakes and grammar. Please let me off all the grammar police, especially you, Sister Buna. Um, our perspective shapes how we interact with our world. It can help or hinder our natural and spiritual progress. In the context of this study, we'll analyze how the way in which we view God, ourselves, the world and people and everything in between affect the choices we make, thus impacting how much of God's plan we fulfill. Colossians 3 verses 2 says, and set your minds and keep them set on what is above the higher things, not the things that are on the earth. So our starting point is understanding that all good things and true knowledge comes from the father of lights in whom there is no variableness or shadow of turning. Proverbs 2, 6 to 8 says, for the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. The foundation of our knowledge is first believing God is who and what his word says he is. Hebrews eleven sixteen. But without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Just a few more scriptures. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Proverbs 9 and 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Proverbs 4 and 7, wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Understanding meaning discernment, comprehension, and interpretation. So in the Strong's Concordance, you'll see that the word understanding comes from a Greek word, synesis. It means facts properly joined together, or holistic understanding, synthesized reasoning, and it says here, for the believer, this connects the dots through sanctified in inductive reasoning done under God. A lot of times uh, the devil stops us from connecting the dots and we get sometimes off track because we are unable to put things together. But I'll give you an example of putting things together. If the Apostle Paul only read the Bible, he wouldn't have been able to go to Mars Hill and speak to those um, pagan philosophers from their own poetry what he was able to do was to put together what he read of their poetry with the word of God and show them the one true God. This is why it's important as believers, we don't just read the Bible. Yes, the Bible is the primary and source and authority for what we believe, but we actually, to win people in this world, we have to understand who they are and what they are. So Paul was able to quote from those philosophers' poetry by putting together what he understood about them with the word of God, therefore making him an effective evangelist perspective in depth now. So influences on perception. Perception is an unconscious process where you take in sensory information from your environment and use that information in order to construct your own version of reality. Influences on perception include past experiences, assumptions and expectations, character traits, education, childhood upbringing, self-concept, culture, faith, values, preconceived notions and present circumstances. 
past experiences in education. What you perceive is strongly influ influenced by your past experience, education, culture, values, and other factors. All these influences predispose you to pay particular attention to certain information and to organize and interpret the information in certain ways. If you attended a friend's party last week, that was boring, that may predispose you to thinking that the next one will be boring as well. Assumptions and preconceptions. Past experience in education can lead to assumptions and preconceived notions. There have been many experiments conducted to show the extent to which the information processed by an individual depends upon his or her, or her own assumptions and preconceptions. For example, it says, you know, we should read the two signs below and the whole point of it is that people would read this differently. Um, your expectations subconsciously tell you what to look for and how to interpret what you see. Repeated expectations or exposure can create a pattern of expectations. These patterns can form a mindset that predisposes you to think a certain way. In the illustration below, read the colors of the words aloud, not the words themselves. I need a volunteer. Can someone read the colors of the words aloud and not the words themselves? I can't do it, I'm colorblind. So this, this would confuse me anyway, and that would take us down another route. But is there anyone who's not colorblind who could read the colors of the words and not the words themselves? Okay, I'll do it. Blue, pink, green, brown, Red, purple, brown, blue, green, red, purple, pink, I think, purple, blue, green, red. And how did you find that? Was that easy or did you have to think about it? It's not easy because the brain is trying to make you read the word as opposed to looking at the colour. Right. So most people find it difficult to remove the interference effect of the words when trying to state the colors. This is because the human brain becomes conditioned to recognize words without effort. You see the meaning of words without much effort. However, trying to name the color is not spontaneous. By easily recognizing the meaning causes your thoughts to go in a different direction. Because of that, it requires more effort Sorry, because of that, it requires more effort to name the color than it does to simply read the word. Your pattern of expectation of reading words is so deeply embedded, it cannot be turned off and creates the interference with the task of simply naming the colors. So context and circumstances. Perception is also influenced by the context in which it occurs. Different circumstances evoke different sets of expectations. You may expect to be in danger at night rather than during the day. For example, if you hear footsteps behind you in the dark alley at night, you would probably perceive you are in danger. However, if you hear footsteps behind you on a busy street in the middle of the day, you would not probably perceive danger. People tend to perceive danger at night rather than during the day. So in summary, you're, you construct your perception. You construct it based on how you choose to see the world. That construction is influenced by several factors. Influences on perception include past experiences, education, values, culture, preconceived notions, and present circumstances. In the end, perception, in the end, uh, the perception you construct becomes your reality. So just a little graph here, or sorry, demonstration picture, factors influencing um, attitude formation, so experience again, social norms, observing people in the environment, or classical and operant conditioning. I'm not going to go into the meanings of all of those, but the pictures kind of explain um, the meaning of them. So first question I want to ask now, have bad experiences of church and church folk changed the way you view God, yourself and people? It's open to anybody. His purpose in this question, I'm not just trying to know your business. <laughs> I think it I think it will do because you associate God with church. Hmm. 
So if you 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 especially if you are a um, non churched person, um, so your 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 perception of who God is will come from these people that that say that they represent God. So, so I think, I think you can't, you can't really get away from that, especially, but it, it, it may change the more you, you mature in Christ and get to know him. But I think initially it, it will do. So it's kind of like when people say, you know, when they're young, they serve God through their parents, but when they're older, they get into a relationship with God and serve God directly. So as you said, um inevitably you're going to look at people who represent God sometimes and form opinions based on what church is or who God is based on the way those people behave so I think everybody could could say if they were going to be honest that bad experience at some stage of their walk and depending on what part of the walk you are bad experiences of church and church people does sometimes change the way you view God yourself and people I think it's inescapable um as you said to be on so we don't have to labor that point um so psalms 16 10 to say, um, 16 10 to 11 says I believed and clung to my God when I said I am greatly afflicted I said in my alarm all men are liars because people have been hurt by church leadership and authority figures in the church they have sometimes believed that unchallenged behavior misbehavior, sorry, unbiblical traditions and biblical cultural norms in church, manipulation and control are part of what church is or should be. Sometimes people realize the contradictory nature of certain rules, behaviors, and man-made doctrines. Um, sorry, sometimes people realize the contradictory nature of certain rules, behaviors, and man-made doctrines, and they rebel against the church and fall prey to false doctrine, false religion. Uh, such experiences cause some to view God and or church through a lens of distrust, hurt, pain, shame, embarrassment, and anger. In some cases, rather than attribute the bad things they have that have happened to them to the error of man or the wickedness of Satan, they find fault in God and or paint all church people or leaders with the same brush. So before we get into bias, it's important to say and to go over that point and that our perspective of who God is, our perspective of church, our perspective of the way things should be are sometimes uh, skewed by what we experience. And we cannot deny that. But the whole point of this study is to get us to a place where we have God's perspective and his opinion on everything. And a lot of people are suffering actually because of what they've experienced in church um, and thought to be common church behavior. A lot of people, that's why they don't come back to church because they never got to a place in their relationship with God where they could separate what man does, what Satan influences men to do sometimes and who God is and that God is perfect. And that even though we might not have a perfect church, we have a perfect God and that he's coming back for his church. He's not coming back for anything else. He's coming back for the church that he left. And so we do see a lot of people now who refuse to come to church because of the experience and the perspective that they have on church based on the way they've experienced church. So let's look at bias. So we have learned that various things have a direct influence on how we perceive and interact with our world. Some of these varying factors, such as education, culture, and childhood upbringing cause us to form biases. But let's define bias. Bias is a disproportionate weight in favor of or against an idea or a thing, usually in a way that is close-minded, prejudicial, or unfair biases can be innate or learned there are types of uh biases so there's conscious bias known as explicit bias and there's unconscious bias also known as implicit bias we'll get into some examples of bias later on people may develop biases for or against an individual a group or belief in science and engineering a bias is a systematic error statistical bias results from unfair sampling of a population or from an estimation process that does not give an re accurate results on average. So for example, um, 
if you walk down the street and the first, you know, six Indian people you see, you ask them a question. And then uh, if they give you all the same answer, and then now you say that all Indian people believe this, that would be um, statistical bias because you just haven't got a, a good enough uh, representative sample of the Indian population for you to be making uh, judgments. But that is an example of, of statistical bias and that happens a lot in media, but we're not gonna get into that. If being biased is to prefer one side in a dispute or to favor one interpretation or to sympathize with one cause, it does not follow automatically that this is wrong. There are many occasions when we take up such a position in our relations with our friends and family and in political arguments and in informal settings. In these situations, bias is viewed as natural or reasonable. It is only on particular occasions in particular roles that such behavior is liable to be criticized. For example, teachers are not expected to award high marks for essays just because they echo their own political prejudices. That's not supposed to be the case, but we know that does happen, that sometimes in education, teachers often sometimes favor students and pupils who align with their own thinking. Uh, Matt Grawich, PhD, says, if you spend any time on Twitter, LinkedIn, or Facebook, odds are you have seen people railing about biases. The term bias is thrown around a lot, often in reference to errors in decision-making. For example, confirmation bias, or observe differences among groups, e.g. gender bias in science, technology, and engineering and mathematics fields. Bias has now acquired a clearly derogatory definition, as can be seen, in a Merriam-Webster's current definition compared to the definition offered in 1828 or in 90, or even 1913. The original meaning was a leaning of the mind, so as to lean or incline from a state of indifference. Though Herbert Spencer uh, in 19, 1873 remarked that biases can influence our beliefs much more so than evidence. I've underlined that for a reason. Now that's stick in your head. Biases can influence our beliefs much more so than evidence. It wouldn't be accurate to conclude that biases themselves are bad. They simply represent a predisposition of favor to a given conclusion over other conclusions. So biases are not always bad. We should be biased towards the word of God, the correct in interpretation of it anyway. But not all bias is not always negative. So another question here, how can childhood upbringing, past experiences and education affect your perspective in your faith walk? How can childhood upbringing, past experiences and education affect your perspective in your faith walk? Any examples? I think it's easy to um use your head knowledge sometimes to understand the things of faith and the things of the spirit so like if you're taught in school that if you do really well and you you know learn everything you need to learn pass your GCSEs and A levels and get A's then you will be successful and faith is that I do not need a grade I do not need a man constructed qualification to determine my success because my faith is in God so I think right. like the education thing is a big thing and also past experiences sometimes we can use our past experiences as a crutch so you can kind of be like okay but I did this and I did this and this is what happened and use that as your basis of how you live your life but faith is such that you are believing in the things that you cannot see or the things that you don't know or you haven't tried yet and I think yeah it's a, it's a big it's a big thing definitely is there anyone who wants to build on that agree or disagree childhood upbringing past experiences and education of what about the phenomenon of a lot of children from Christian backgrounds who go to university and they go in there somewhat saved and come out an unbeliever? So Melissa alluded to it about learning things and then trying to match them with things of the spirit because a lot of what we believe and understand to man is not logical. 
the wisdom of man and the wisdom of God are completely opposite in some cases. Has anybody I got any examples? Sorry, go ahead. I think that um, when you're talking about the, the, the children going to university, etc., cetera, um, I think sometimes with our children, a lot of what they have receive or some of these children it's learnt behavior it's not actually um the word getting into their heart and transforming they they've not been fully convinced of 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 the word of god so if something isn't really um i was listening to um actually a book this morning by um aw tozer and he says that the 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 um we are so quickly convinced of the word of god because um for instance um a famous scientist say well you know god must be true because x x y and z is 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 true or he says that somebody famous will say well i believe in jesus so he goes that then a lot of us will say well well god must be real because look at how big and how famous this person is so they must be real and he says what it is is that the word of god hasn't really gotten into the heart and of the person so we 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 base our our faith walk on external things, mm. and then when those things are moved and are tested, we're easily we're easily removed. It shows actually that we didn't really believe in the first place because we're, our faith is not on um, substantial things. It's on yeah. Rem yeah. Yeah, I think that's I think that's very true. I observed in my time of youth leadership that a lot of children were going to higher education, as you say, Sister Dion, having had a external experience of God, as in they come to church, they hear the word and they see things, and but the internal experience that would actually cause them to turn to God in the times of trouble wasn't there because they didn't really experience God, even though they may have spent their whole lives in church. And so their whole, they almost now are like a, someone who was in the world because yes, they came to church and yes, they saw things and yes, they saw their parents serve God, but actually because they didn't have a, 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 a personal experience when those foundations or those things were removed from their life, it was th their whole faith walk wasn't even a walk. They were just in church. Um, anybody else wants to speak on this? How childhood upbringing and past experiences can, and education can affect your walk or your perspective in your faith walk. Okay, I'll move on. So examples of bias now. So confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is the tendency to search for, interpret, favor and recall information in a way that confirms or supports one's prior beliefs or values. People display this bias when they select information that supports their views, ignoring contrary information or when they interpret ambiguous evidence as supporting the existing attitude. I put ignoring the Bible here um, in exclamation marks and you'll see why later on. The effect is strongest for desired outcomes, for emotionally charged issues and for deeply entrenched beliefs. Confirmation bias cannot be eliminated entirely, but it can be managed, for example, by education, training, and um, education and training in critical thinking skills. So that's what the world says. But I put, you can manage confirmation bias by always using the word as a mirror to whatever you see, hear, or do. All right. So if we have a tendency to interpret and to favor and to recall information that supports beliefs. Uh, that we have maybe grown up with that are not uh, in tune with the Bible, we always have the word to, to use as a mirror. I remember the first time I said to India and I was asked to give a word, I said, um, sometimes culture 
allows what God forbids. And we see that a lot. Sometimes our culture of church has allowed a lot of things that God is not even necessarily in agreement with, which is why the mirror of the word is always the standard we should be using. So how could confirmation bias, sorry, if I put it wrong here, how could confirmation bias hinder our search for truth? Based on what you've just heard, I'll leave the definition on the screen. How could confirmation bias hinder our search for the truth? Um, it, you, you've said it in your, your slide, um, because you keep on searching for information to um, confirm what you've all, the information you've already received. So received being the operative word there, because it doesn't mean that the information that you have already is true. So that goes back to the original question of your upbringing. If in your upbringing, it was all about secularism and or looking down on if you like people that have a faith then that will um have an impact on on how you go forward yeah that, that, that is basically it and i'm going to make it a bit more churchified so many of you might not know who this is i didn't know who this person was until like a few weeks ago um until my sister-in-law um, saw something that he posted online. And I was like, oh, I know this guy who used to, you know, be in the scene uh, in Canada. And, you know, she said there was always something off about him. And so I've put the role confirmation bias plays in our acceptance of false doctrine and teachers. So if you don't know who this guy is, recently there was a, a, a um, he had a church in Jamaica and they, um, long story short he was sacrificing people he cut one woman's throat I think he shot someone else but when I went to check him out the first thing I saw on his Facebook was his name was his excellency and for me I was just like that's a red flag like from he's called himself his excellency I know I don't need to listen to this guy but yet a lot of people still listen to him were inviting him to the to their church and when you dig deeper into this guy, uh, when he was in Canada, he was convicted of sexual assault and he ended up back in Jamaica. But despite that sexual assault on a man, by the way, not that that makes it any worse or better, but that's just the facts. Um, and he uh, was still invited to a lot of churches. And if you go, now go on YouTube, you can see a lot of videos of him doing a lot of nonsense. You can even see demons manifesting him. It's so crazy that people actually fell for it. But... I felt like what what role did confirmation bias play in some people believing this guy now i know that the bible says his sheep my sheep know my voice and they will come to me but there are people who um on their christian journey for for some part of it they are deceived and they are under false teachers false bishop false doctrines and so like i wanted to look into how confirmation bias could potentially have played a role in this guy having so much um influence and and and, and people following him so i put this post on um uh instagram a, a few weeks ago i put 40 foundations are being exposed in this season if what you're doing or seeing sorry if what you're doing or seeing done is not built upon the foundations of the apostles or prophets and jesus christ leave it alone be like the Bereans. check your doctrine be holy and stay close to christ so ephesians 20 19 uh, to 20 says now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens of the saints and the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles prophets Jesus Christ himself being the chief corner stone I have a rule for things that I believe if I can't find the foundation in the prophets the Jesus Christ and the apostles if I can't find confirmation of those three I'm not really going to believe it because I don't have to, because this is my foundation. And a lot of what this guy was saying was doing was nowhere near this foundation. So then that causes me to believe that people were not holding up his actions, his words or his lifestyle to the word. So then I thought, how could someone like Kevin Smith deceive so many? Is it because he looked and sounded like many people we have known or perceived to be anointed? 
Could it be because many of us are programmed to believe that noise or emotionalism or excitement equals anointing? Speaking in tongues equals the sign of a genuine believer. Eloquence and or good knowledge of the scripture equals spiritual and moral excellence. Is it that we are programmed to believe that accurate prophecy legitimizes and validates a person's ministry? Or that financial gain and commercial acumen or success equals the favor of God? For popularity in Christian communities, preaching abroad and acceptance from celebrities and politicians equals a genuine man of God. So I have another question. What is common to all the things I just read on the left? What is common about all the things I read on the left? It's nothing to do, everything is to do with the flesh and nothing to do with discerning of the spirit. Everything on the left can be mimicked by Satan. Satan can get you emotional. He can make, he can make, he can tingle your emotions. Satan can speak in tongues. Uh, Satan can, uh, can, can speak through someone uh, 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 with, act, with good scriptural knowledge. Like, just because you can speak the word and know the Bible, that doesn't make you morally good. That doesn't mean that you live, you live a holy life. Accurate prophecy doesn't mean that a person is a, is a true prophet of God. Because Satan can prophesy too. Fin financial gain and commercial acumen or success doesn't mean the favor of God. Satan give, gives good gifts too. Satan can make you rich too popularity in Christian communities and preaching abroad and acceptance from celebrities and politicians, Satan can give you all of that. What did Satan offer Jesus when he went up on, on, on that pinnacle? He was offering him the kingdoms of this world, yeah? And we know that Satan has knowledge of the word. And we know that Satan was in the presence of God. So Satan can get you emotional. I know a good organist that can, can play in front of you right now, you'll get emotional, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's the spirit of God. So I put, those whose erroneous biases were confirmed in Kevin Smith ignored the contrary information about his life and doctrine that would have led them to the truth about him. Their confirmation bias born of ideas and doctrines not backed by the prophets, apostle, or Jesus Christ led them to supporting an agent of Satan. Discernment and logic, unfortunately, are severely lacking in the kingdom because to realize this man and many others are frauds does not even require a revelation of the Holy Spirit. A lot of the decept deceptors in the kingdom of God, you don't even need the Holy Spirit to discern. If you just check the word, the Bible says that by their fruits, we will know them when it's talking about false prophets. A lot of these people who are ministering, their lives do not have the fruit of the spirit in them. Their fruit of their ministry is not clean. But for some reason, we avoid that and we go with what, what our bias towards them confirms. I'll use a big example, T.D. Jakes. I don't have to go through everything that he's doing because I, I'm not, I'm, I don't dig into his personal life. I only talk about what he does in public. He had yoga in his church. But because he preached some good messages 20 years ago, and maybe he can still preach a good word now, people will, will not stop supporting that guy's ministry. doesn't make sense to me. If you've got yoga in your church, you're aligned with Satan. Because yoga is a spiritual thing. You ask a Hindu about yoga, you cannot detach yoga from the spiritual nature of it. So why would people still support him? Because he confirms a lot of our biases that we have come to understand and think and to know or to, to believe that represents God. Yeah. Speaking in tongues and accurately prophesying is all well and good and there's space for it, but it doesn't make you a, 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 a true man or woman of God. The Bible says that there will be people who cast out demons in the name of God and God will say, I didn't know them. So if we want to know if someone is true or not, read the word and ask God. That's all we have to do. Follow the word. If that person's ministry, their life is not aligning with the word, then something is up. Now, this is not to say some people might not be struggling or whatever, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about people who are clearly false preachers or false teachers. We have the word as a mirror and the Lord helps us to discern, but guess what? Everything doesn't even need a deep level of spiritual knowing. 
Listen to this. Logic is reasoned, conduct, conduct, sorry, reasoning conducted or assessed according to strict principles of validity, right? We need to be like the Bereans. Listen to the scripture. Now, the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. The attitude of the Bereans exemplifies how we should receive and review the words we hear from ministers. These people were eager to hear the word from the apostle. However, rather than just blindly accept what the apostle said, they used the mirror of the word to ensure what he said was in line with the scriptures. Discernment isn't just spiritual knowing or a hunch. Discernment is sometimes just asking questions, interrogating the information received and allowing the word of God to confirm or deny its validity. And this is the scripture in Matthew 7, 15. I won't read all of it, but it just says, who are false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. And a commentary here says, listen, in the Old Testament, God's true prophets were often in the minority. A true test of a prophet was the conformity of his doctrine to the scriptures. Their fruits refer not only to the actions of their lives, but also to the doctrines they proclaim. Two trees are contrasted in relation to the fruits they produce. And it also says they look like lambs, but act like wolves. Like we expect the deceivers to come looking like deceivers. <laughs> I don't understand. They're going to look and sound like true believers. But anyway, just to close off this section, this is the reason why people ultimately fall for deception and stay in deception. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan of all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this, God, for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. If you love truth, you'll never be deceived. Maybe for a day or a week, but not, 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 not eternally. You will never ever end up in error full time if you love the truth. Um, Brother Michael, there's a comment from Sister Daniel in the chat. Go ahead. Okay. Many don't question these preachers because they are hearing what they want to hear. Exactly. Often we don't want the truth. So when things like yoga creep in those congregations, people struggle to challenge what they know is true. That is exactly what I'm talking about and what the Bible confirmed. Because people hear what they are wanting to hear, as the Bible talks about itching ears, they don't question it. They don't question it. But there's also another side. There are some people who have been brought up in this way and don't even necessarily know that this is wrong. And this is kind of what this study is about. It's just calling us all to just pointing us in the direction of Jesus. Fundamentally, the most important thing in our lives is our relationship with God. Because I believe that God can speak to, to everyone as clearly as anyone else. I believe God can speak to me as clearly as he speaks to, spoke to the Apostle Paul. Everyone should have that desire that God speaks to them clearly so that they would never be deceived. But when you don't love the truth, then you will receive things and you will ignore things that you don't like about what you receive. But for me, the word has to chisel, chisel, me, chisel the, the bad part of me away. I've got to receive the word, whether it confirms or whether, it, 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 or whether it, it, it comes against me. That's the only way I'm gonna get better. If the word tells me that I'm doing something wrong, I have to listen to it. If the word cuts me, I've got to take the cut. The, the problem is a lot of us don't know how to take the cutting. We can only take the, 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 the good word or the word that says we coming out, but the word that tells us that we need to, to suffer a little, or the word that tells us we need to change our ways, we don't want that word, but that's the word that's gonna help you improve. Some people just want to see signs and wonders in their life, without surrendering to Jesus or living holy from the Barbara. That's another fact. And we're actually gonna get into that later on in the study about suffering and about why suffering is necessary and about you know, submitting to God and living holy and how we actually do see signs and wonders in our life. It doesn't just come like that. There has to be a process. Jesus, the Bible says, he, he learned 
obedience through the things that he suffered. Like we, we in Christendom, suffering is the most avoided topic. We hear all about grace and nothing about suffering. And suffering is our key to glory. If we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. But yeah, let's move on. So more um, defining bias. So unconscious bias. This is where it gets interesting now. Unconscious biases are social stereotypes about certain groups of people uh, that individuals form outside of their own uh, conscious awareness. Everyone holds unconscious beliefs about various social and identity, identity groups. And these biases stem from one's tendency to organize social worlds by categorizing. Unconscious bias is far more prevalent than conscious prejudice and often incompatible with one's conscious values. Certain scenarios can activate unconscious attitudes and beliefs. For example, biases may be more prevalent when multitasking or working under time pressure. So here's this question now, how may unconscious bias affect the way we relate to believers who do not look like us? How may unconscious bias affect the way we relate to believers who do not look like us? I'll, get, I'll start this one. <laughs> if you come from a very Jamaican church, and you go to a church that is not Jamaican, automatically, some of those people believe that it can't be, it can't be the real thing. <laughs> Sister Bueller, you, you better say that out loud. I ain't reading your comment. <laughs> but okay, I'm a Jamaican, right? And I'm from a very Jamaican church. And I go to a church that's predominantly white and they don't worship like the way a Jamaican church does. Our biases, sometimes conscious and unconscious, will think, mm, I don't know, I don't really feel the spirit. Now, their worship is just as valid, is, is, they're, they're touching God just as much as the Jamaican church, because it's not like what we know or experience, we tend to think that it's somehow less than, am I lying? No, true word. So unconscious biases, our unconscious biases about certain ethnicities can cause us to not experience the glory of God. I'll give you an example. If I went, when, I, when I've been to India a few times I have, if I went with the idea of the way I worship and the way my, the, the, you know, my church sounded, and if I went with that attitude, then I would never have been able to worship in another culture, in another language. I didn't speak Indian but I was able to sing along with their songs and worship in the way they, they worshipped because um, my recognition was that God is everywhere and there's no way an Indian church is going to worship like an African church there's no way that a, 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 a church in um, southern America is going to worship like a church in Kingston Jamaica and so if we go to places with these closed mindsets, we will almost convince ourselves that the spirit can't be there. But let me tell you something, the same way that God sometimes gives me a word in worship in my bedroom is the same way he gave me a word in worship when I was in India and I needed a word. And it didn't sound nothing like the, the, the church I came from. And it didn't even look like it because everybody looked different. Sister Beulah said, if you don't sing from the Pentecostal hymnal, the best of all or redemption hymnal, you ain't going nowhere. I, <laughs> that's, that's a fact. Some people don't believe that unless you sing from certain hymn books, then it, it can't be the right way. Or as Jamaicans will say, that's not it. You know, we have become very accustomed to making our experience doctrine. It's very dangerous. You need to listen for the voice of God and you need to know the spirit of God because you can miss out on building relationships in the kingdom with people who don't look like you if you only think you your type, type of person goes uh to heaven uh michael i've told yes. you this one before there was a certain church i went to there was a bible study that was going on and i answered a question and the person that was leading it said oh doesn't she know her bible well <laughs> <laughs> in yes. brackets unsaid for a white person it's very unfortunate and 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 it's you know we make a joke but seriously i'm 
personally, I'm tired of going to black churches. And when I say that, don't get me wrong, I'm tired of going to churches where everyone looks like me. I want to go to churches or I want to visit churches where there is all different nationalities, right? But we have to break down some of our natural biases and our natural tendencies or some of the things that we have learned about peoples and cultures in order to make sure that the kingdom, um, it, you know, there's, there's a lot less discord. Um, we, we just have to, we have to understand that a lot of things we learn were culture and it wasn't necessarily the word. We have to look at things through the lens of the word and not the lens of our experience all the time. Otherwise we will get stuck and we will, we will never experience the benefits of the kingdom of God. The kingdom is vast. The kingdom has, every, the Bible says, his house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. So why should I be satisfied to go to a church where everybody comes from Jamaica? Now, don't get me wrong. If you're in a majority, if you're in Jamaica, then the church is going to be full of Jamaicans. But yeah, it's just a beauty. Yeah, I think as well, what doesn't help is that um, you just you just kind of touched on it. So the kingdom of God is so much more and so much wider and bigger than, yeah, than we can actually really see or comprehend. And I think because we've done such a great job at ring fencing ourselves at times and staying in one particular corner and that our doors are not um you know, the, the, the lines between organizations or um, all these things are not, are not blurred enough. And so because of that, um, you know, when you're only in one place, you only see one thing and you think this is it, this is, this is it. But um, if we had ways where we, we really worshiped together and wider and broader and even were really international and, and all these different things, then we could we could really see just how vast and broad the kingdom of God is, just how God expresses himself or, or reveals himself in different places and in different ways. Um, and then we wouldn't be so hung up on some of the things that, yeah, some of, uh, um, you know, equating our experiences to being the way, the truth and the life kind of thing. I think it's important in this end time that we recognize this and that we pull away from some of that stuff because God is building his end time church and it's not gonna look like our church looked 50 years ago. Like even just for the pure fact that we always, we've talked about it before, the way, and, and Sister Dion, you said, why am I picking on Jamaicans? Cause I'm from a Jamaican heritage. So I can't speak from another perspective, someone else can. Um, but, you know, we, we've talked about how in the sixties, the reason why churches, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, Jamaican or ch Caribbean churches uh, were built the way they were built is because the white churches wouldn't let them in. So they just had to create their own church. And so, you know, that was what it was. And people coming in from Jamaica or from other Caribbean islands or Africa or whatever needed a church to go to that they could feel familiar with. But we know now Britain, say, for example, in England, is such a much more multicultural society. There's no reason why your church should be all black now and you're in England. Like the, the, the necessity of building a church like that in the 60s no longer exists. And so we need to break out of some of the mentalities and mind frames that were maybe necessary at the time, but it's no longer necessary now. And we need to have a different perspective. Um, Sister Daniel. I think Buda covered most of it, but my, my main thing is that we are, well, a lot of churches or church people, Christians, are too led by tradition and culture. And so because of that, it just makes it very, very difficult to look and see people in a different way. If we're, not, if we're led by love and by, by the truth of the word, that will frame how you see people. But because we're so led by tradition and culture, it's like, even though we know the word, but it's, we're not really seeing past what God is saying to us in the word, like we're not seeing the word for what it is, the purity of the word, you know, when, when God talks about love. And it's so, um, we're so fixed and so, we said it already, on one idea of one thing, 
it's hard to see people differently. You can't see someone and just see them dip to see that, oh my God, no, this person loves Jesus and she's wonderful. She just loves the Lord. You just see what you see in front of you with your human eye. And that's the problem. We're, we're seeing people through our fleshly eyes and we're not being led by the spirit. And that is an issue. Um, yeah, 100, 100% um, agree. Um, and we're going to deal with race actually later on in this study because there's a very sly spirit out there. Um, well, I mean, it's not sly because the Bible says that at the end times, nation will rise against nation, which means ethnicity against ethnicity. But um, we're going to deal with the frame of race because the way if we start to view the world through race, and by the way, race is a flu- that race is not a, a real thing. There's only one race, human race. But the concept of race that was created and constructed by men, if we view the world through that, that's also going to affect the way we do church. And so 100% agree um, with, you know, what you just said. Also, there are some good traditions that we should keep, but there are some traditions that we, we really should let go. But we'll get that onto that later in the study. Experience bias. We take our perception to be objective truth. And we're kind of going over some of what we just talked about. We may be the stars of our own show, but other people see the world slightly differently than we do. Experience bias occurs when we fail to remember that. We assume our view of a given problem or situation constitutes the whole truth. To escape the bias, we need to build in systems for others to check our thinking, share their perspectives, and help us reframe the situation at the situation at hand and I've put here how can experience bias cause issues in the kingdom sister Bula how can experience bias cause issues in the kingdom sorry why are you thinking of me what's going on because <laughs> I know that you're very opinionated <laughs> so I'm going to use you how can experience bias cause issues in the kingdom um Okay, well, in, in one instance, I think everyone's everyone's path to God is different. Yeah. And so I think we have to just be careful that because I found God this way or my, or my path to him was much straighter than someone else's, it means that... It, um, That's the only way yeah and sometimes we can also restrict you know I've, I've for example for example I see this sometimes in in families like where um we're so desperate for a child to be saved or for a nephew or grandson or whatever or whoever it is to be to be saved and they may they may want to go to a, a different church or they might want to go to a, or they might be going through a different experience of, of God and it's not the direct line yeah. and because it's not the direct line that we believe it is we say no no and we want to control that process whereas sometimes there is a wilderness phase sometimes there is and you have to release them to God and say you know what God do <laughs> do what you're doing with them for them to to to, to get to you but if we control, if we try and control people's process to God and control people's process to, you know, how the, 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 the depth into God, then you just, you stunt their growth. You stunt, you stunt it. You stunt it. You can be actually, actually become a stumbling block. That is, that is, because you've experienced it this way and this, and this how. Yeah. And I think it's key to point out, and you started with it, we have to acknowledge everybody is on a journey now whether that journey is to hell or to heaven everybody's on a journey but especially in the christian journey everybody's on a journey and as you say and people call it the come to jesus moment everybody's coming to jesus is not the same and the bible clearly shows us this with the different type of people jesus was interacting with right and we have to understand that because you got saved in one way it doesn't mean that that that's person's journey some people and, um, you know, there's a lot of, my brother calls them, there's a lot of net churches. There's a lot of churches that, that, that their doctrine is terrible. And what they believe is terrible. Guess what? They are nets. They catch people and people are caught by the one or two true words they do say. 
But when that person starts to come to majority, maturity, they don't stay and they move on to a church that actually does teach, you know, proper sound whole biblical truth. But as you say, sometimes when we are trying to interfere in, in, in the part of the journey that God didn't tell us to interfere in, we can sometimes mess with people's journey because we think they should be coming to God in a certain way. So we always have to acknowledge that people are coming to God and they might not come the way that we came. Is there any other examples? of How experience bias can cause issues in the kingdom? We've kind of touched on some of them already. If I experienced one type of church, would that not cause me to believe that another type of church is wrong? I'm not talking about doctrine here. I'm just talking about maybe the way people organize church. Some people might have the offering after church. Some people might have the offering before the speaker. Wouldn't that, um, wouldn't that play to how mature you are? Yeah. Because you, you, you can't, if, if I, for instance, like I, I've visited loads of churches and you can't, you can't paint one brush with the other. Like um, every church is going to be different because it's a different house. It's a different set of people. Like I don't, um, for instance, I don't have carpet in my house. I only have wooden floor but my mom has both carpet and wooden floor. Does it mean that she, her setup is wrong or I use, you know, vinegar to wash my chicken or she uses lemon? Does it mean that it's, it's, it's wrong? I think it's, it's, it's according to maturity. And as you said, it's, if it's what somebody has known and they've grown up to, they've grown up with, of course you're going to believe that it's it's right and it's the only way. But that's why it always comes back to, and I think this whole study can be summed up. You have to know God through His Word, always through the Word, because I think that even like now in this season. We're so hyped up about um, the miraculous and the this and this has to be that and this has to be that, but we 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 get so lazy when it comes to reading the word. We have to learn to measure things through the word. That's the only thing that's gonna save us and it's gonna help us to help others because we're always looking at them and looking at ourselves through the word. Yes, yeah. wonderful. I 100% agree. I don't need to add to it. And we're going to be dealing with, in the coming weeks, God's perspective, um, how we should view him and how God views us and how we should view ourselves and how God views us, which ties into what you were saying. So distance bias. We prefer what's closer over what's further away. And this is kind of along the same lines. Distance biases have become all too common in today's globalized world. They emerge in a meeting, meetings when folks in the room fail to gather input from their remote colleagues who may be dialing in on a conference line. This bias reflects our instincts to prioritize that which is nearby, whether in a physical space, time, or other domains. We can mitigate distance bias with systems that acknowledge important figures outside our immediate proximity such as by calling on remote colleagues first in a meeting before discussing with the room. How can distance bias create disunity in the kingdom? We've kind of touched on that, but if anybody wants to go back in, they can do that. How can distance bias cause issues in church organizations? So distance bias is preferring that which is near and that which is afar and privileging um, the opinions and the thoughts of those which are closer than those who are further away. So can anybody think of any ways in which distance bias can create disunity and also cause issues in church organizations? 
Yeah, so it, it kind of depends where your HQ is sometimes, right? Right. So you're at the HQ or the, um, the, I don't know what, yeah, the, the, the main focal point of the organization sometimes. So the churches around there, they may get, um, I don't know if it's resources yeah. or easier access to the information or they have, um, uh, yeah, if they're if they're in a higher density as well in in particular areas, then um, certain ministries or certain um, aspects are in higher concentration there than in the places which are further away, stuff like that. Right, you might be, you know, your HQ might be in London, but you have a church in Portugal, and you know because the because you have more churches in london or in portugal or because the hq's in london you're not really taking on the opinions or concerns of that pastor or those people whose church is in portugal and so we have to and and, and that's maybe for so for something leaders to think about but on a on a on a basic level again just going back to our experiences of church and our own sometimes prejudices like just because um, a believer is from far away it doesn't mean their experience of God or their opinion about maybe a potential church you know issue is any less because we in the west tend to tend to prioritize our western view of the world as the view of the world like God doesn't have a western view of the world God doesn't love you know America and the UK more than he loves India or Africa and because of the way the media presents things to us, we sometimes always think from the lens of how the West views things. Like if you look on TV, you know it. Like if someone dies in France, it's a big issue. If someone dies in Nigeria, no one cares. Like if there's terrorism in France, it's news for 10 days. If terrorism in Nigeria, it's news for like 20, 24 hours. So we have to be careful once again, how are we viewing things? How are we viewing the world? What lens are we viewing it from? Are we allowing the media to shape? The way we think about things, are we allowing our proximity to things? But well, we'll deal with the media in another week because that's a lot. But yeah, that's a very big word to Catherine. Hegemony. Yeah, hegemony is when, you know, if, if, if your organization is dominated by, I don't know, French people, for example, but then they have churches in Brazil, then it's going to be a French perspective for that whole organization. That's not good. Um, it's the Dion Port nepotism. Yeah, sometimes we have family churches where, you know what, because the son is good at playing the drums, he plays the drum, but he's not even saved. Maybe you should have got someone, you know, who, who was saved. Maybe he wasn't as good on the drums, but it's best he played the drums than the unsaved son who's the son of the pastor. There's many ways in which um, uh, uh, distance bias can, can actually hinder and cause issues in the kingdom. But primarily disunity and us privileging our point of view or the point of view of everybody who's around us over the people who are further away. We need to understand that everybody's view is valid and equally valid. Now, this goes back to um, what we were talking about, churches doing things differently. It says in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12, 4 and 7. Now, there are distinctive varieties of special, special spiritual gifts, sorry, Special abilities given by the grace and extraordinary power of the Holy Spirit operating in believers, but is the same spirit who grants them and empowers believers. And there are distinctive varieties of ministries and service, but it is the same Lord who is served. And there are distinctive ways of working to accomplish things, but it is the same God who produces all things and all believers, inspiring and energizing and empowering them. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, the spiritual illumination and the enabling of the Holy Spirit for the common good. So the Apostle Paul is saying here, there's going to be, and it says in that King James, differences of administration. There's different ways that different churches are going to do things. As the Dion said, there's going to be different people in that church. There's going to be a part, the different pastor, that pastor is going to, he's not necessarily going to get the same instruction from God for how he runs his church, for how the pastor down the road does. That pastor in that church might specialize in prophecy. That pastor in another church might have a church that specializes in teaching. So we can't always just off the bat, just 
throw people's churches and their ministries down the down the toilet because we don't understand it or it doesn't look like ours that is how we're going to limit ourselves because as i always say there are people in the kingdom who have a key for your next and if you're so arrogant and you're so prideful that you think only your church is going to heaven and only the way you do things is the way for things to be done you're going to get stuck yeah you might have reached a higher a high level in christ but you won't go any further there will be a ceiling because God doesn't give one thing, everything to one man or everything to one church. And so if we walk around with these prideful attitudes like, well, if it don't look like this or it don't sound like this, then that's not it. Then, you know, we're not we're not going to gain the benefits from being in the kingdom and from being part of the body, because at the end of the day, we are all as individuals, one part of the body. Our churches form one part of the body of a greater whole. So if I'm the knee, I'm not going to discriminate against the toe. It doesn't make sense. So safety bias. We protect against loss more than we seek out gain. That's very deep. Safety bias refers to the all too human tendency to avoid loss. Many studies have shown that we would prefer not to lose money even more than we would prefer to gain money. In other words, bad is stronger than good. Safety biases slow down decision-making and hold back healthy forms of risk-taking. John 12, 24 says, Verily, verily I say unto you, except corn wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto etern life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. So I have a question. How can safety bias and our innate instincts of self-preservation hinder our spiritual progress? And I'm just going to go back to the definition of safety bias. How can safety bias and our innate instincts of self-preservation hinder our spiritual progress? I'll add this, you'll find in life that risk takers often achieve more than people who take no risks. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, this is one more I could talk about <laughs> for a while. But um, um, I can only talk about the tradition that I'm from. So I think if we look back at what our elders have achieved, um, you know, they were, they, they, I don't know what happened, but things, they were, they were entrepreneurial, they took risks to build and create um, the foundation that, that they did, which was fantastic. Many churches having their own buildings, you know, the, um, you know, lots of people um, coming to Christ and, and these things. And then at a certain moment, I don't know if there's like a critical, you know, a critical mass point. It's like, well, we've got, we've got it, we've got it good, or we've got, what yeah things are good and so as to maintain or so as not to lose it let's not change anything or let's not um keep looking at the spiritual landscape and see what's changing what needs to be done for the for the next and the next and the next and so they just kept a lot of things the same um and then when the next generations will come in and and, and bringing um you know, insights into what's happened and what needs to be done to impact their generation with the gospel. Um, fear of doing something different um, and, and losing things meant that they, they relied more on what they saw or knew that worked. So they kept, they kept keep things the same and, you know, let's, you know, we won't lose anything. We won't lose anything. We'll just keep what we, what we have. But unfortunately, that was counterintuitive. And you see that um, we, we've gone through periods where there's major loss of, of um, gifts, of people, of different things from, from our churches for this reason. But I think that's, yeah, for me, one of the bigger examples where just for fear of losing, I don't know if it's either status or losing what... Um, yeah, what, what they worked so hard to achieve, it's best not to branch out and to do anything or to 
connect with you know it's, it's, it's just don't change anything just leave it yeah and sister Catherine said don't want to step out in faith because of what we may lose yeah being a believer is risky business right Jesus said that we are to go out into the highways and the hedges if you know anything about highways and hedges in Jesus' time those were dark dangerous places you had to carry a lamp with you there was no street lights this is a risky business and risk people who don't take risks they never they, they really ever achieve anything great but all of the richest people in the world and the most successful people took risks now technically what we're doing is not taking a risk because we know that if god is authorizing what we're doing then you know we're gonna win and we're gonna be successful if god has authorized it um and what you're speaking to what you're speaking to is to be like yeah in this day and age we have a lot of um churches who have rather than actually trying to initiate revival um they might say they want revival but it's not true why do i say that because some churches they're just happy to open church they're just happy to have the door as long as the doors are open as long as we can keep convocation as long as we can make sure that that's this service happens in april and and june and july when it's supposed to happen that's that's all they're interested in rather than taking the risk of branching out and doing something different because each season and each time era requires something different right paul is not coming or if paul was born into this era he wouldn't be using a, a, a horse yeah he'd be using a car he'd be using a plane and so we have to understand that for each era and for each time there's going to be a difference of administration as paul said there's going to be a different way to work this is going to be a different way to get things done essentially it's all going to be inspired and energized by the holy spirit and we ain't going to break uh no principle of scripture to get it done because there's a way to build the kingdom and that hasn't changed but the methods which we use have changed because like i said there was no airplane in paul's time the case said no open vision yeah no open vision as stabula was saying stick in to doing what we have done before and guess what that's the sign of insanity if you do the same thing and you want a different result. The Bible says David served his generation doing what you did in the 60s. Now, we're not talking principally. We're not talking about praying fasting here. We're talking about the way we do church or even the way we evangelize. Guess what? Most people ain't going to take your flyers now. So you're going to have to be a bit more uh, ingenuitive. Like you're going to have to get online. COVID forced a lot of churches to get online. You don't think God was tired of churches just preaching to four walls and not understanding that there's other ways other than street evangelism. There's also you need to actually get online. Now, street evangelism and home ministry should always have existed and should always be there. But a lot of us neglected the home evangelism or sorry, the home church. And we neglected online. Now God has pushed a lot of these churches and it's like you have to be online now. All right. So we, we sometimes we're very safe and we try to consolidate. But it's funny. Because in our safety and trying to consolidate, we've lost more than we've gained. Yeah. So in trying to avoid loss, we have lost more than we would have gained if we took the risk and stepped up. It's like the, the lepers. Yeah. If we stay here, we're going to die. If we go, if we, if, if we, if we go back into the city, we're going to die. But if we go to the, to, to the opposition army, there's a slight chance that we might live. Unfortunately, many of our churches would not that story in the bible wouldn't be told because we we stay where we are and we are dying and a lot of our churches are almost dead because we refuse to move it's very unfortunate so just gonna finish up now on framing uh, we've got about nine minutes left so i'm gonna rush through this so framing or media framing news is a distilled form of multiple events taking place in the world the media not only selects particular events, it has also has to make sense of them. It has to make them matter to the readers and viewers. This entails setting them within a narrative, a story of social change. This process of selection and narration is captured by the idea of framing. Uh, Robert Entman offers this definition. A frame operates to select and highlight some features of reality and obscure others in a way that tells a consistent story about problems, their causes, moral implications and remedies. A quick example of this, when you watch the six o'clock news, 10 o'clock news, you'll see about eight to 10 stories. 
there's billions of potential stories that happen in this world. What makes those stories interesting? Why are those stories given to you as the stories you should be interesting? The whole point of that is someone has chosen those stories and those stories, that person is deciding the agenda. They are saying that these 10 stories are the most important stories and these are the stories you need to pay attention to. They've privileged those stories over the billions of other stories. They've written a story behind the story or a narrative to create that story and to make it something interesting for you, which is basically giving you a frame or a lens through which to view the world, which is why I don't watch the news really. So framing and bias. The way the frame achieves its effects is through the use of a variety of techniques. Uh, his, uh, William Gampson and Andre Mogliani refer to metaphors, historical examples, catchphrases, depictions, and visual images, all of which function as reasoning devices that offer a view of the causes, effects, and principles that animate the story. Basically, all of that means is it priv they privilege, or the news or the media, they will privilege one account of the world over another. And we're going to get into the media and how dangerous that is. And eventually, we're actually going to do a family day where we are going to be dealing with um, internet safety for our children and talking about you know, media and how we can protect our children from the, you know, the internet, TV, and all these things that are coming uh, to, to, to ultimately um, cause our children to hate God. How is the mainstream media framing current debates around homosexuality and transgenderism? And in answering this question, you're going to understand what media framing is. How is the mainstream media framing current debates around homosexuality and transgenderism? And if any of you have heard about Dave Chappelle, um, he's been in the news recently because he did a, a comedy special and he talked about transgenders. And part of uh, what he said was basically that, you know, a transgender person basically said, you know, a transgender woman is not really a real woman. He didn't say it in those type of words, but there's a whole, you know, big furor about basically him speaking of that. Um, so how is the mainstream media framing current debates around homosexuality and transgenderism? Anybody want to discuss that? Stabula says gender is a fact. Well, you know, said Dave Chappelle. Yeah. Go ahead. It's, 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 it's re, it's almost like it's rewiring our brain to go against what we see and know to be natural and God's <laughs> order. Yeah. So it, it, it it's, um, it's framing it in such a way where they, it, it, it's been, a, so I was listening to, um, I think an interview yesterday, um, yesterday. So the, the, the teacher or the speaker, he was saying that it's been attached to different issues. So like, um, it, because it's so heinous and it's so unbelievable, you can't, your, your, your natural mind would never think, oh my God, it, you know, this is, yeah, this is really good. So he says that what is being done, it's been attached to certain issues like racism or um, are not, um, what do you call it? people that are Nazis or um, all these evil type of things. So therefore, if you don't agree with the issue, then you're, you're bad right. and you're right. like these people. So th 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 that's how it's like this. And you see it again and again, like they bring all these pastors on and these um, these um people that are in high profile places that profess to be Christian. And this is the one question that they're always pressing them. And it's not that they're asking them the question, they actually frame it in a way, you need to come out and agree with this, agree with this, agree with this. So if these high profile people agree with it, those people that are following them like, later, 
well, why don't we agree with this? If such and such agree with it and he's a pastor and you, you see it time and time again, it, there was an interview with um, T.D. Jakes. There was one with um, Joel Osteen. There was one with Lecrae that I was watching. Um, uh, was it? Um, a lot of these gospel artists and that they're oh you know I'm not sure I know loads of people that are gay and this and that and they're just so lovely or the thing that they oh my 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 perception is evolving mm. but nobody goes back to the word and said well this is what God says and this is my view because I love God I don't hate you but this is where God sits so this is where I'm sitting Right. And um, you you um, said something key at the beginning. You said rewiring our brains. Um, Sister Catherine said, as Sister Elon says, if you do not agree with the LGBT, well, I call them the alphabet crew, then you hate, then you hate, which is such a strong word. You are being told that you are not to judge as a Christian, which of course we are to judge in righteousness. Yeah, the whole the whole way the enemy is is, is, is putting this across is that in order for me to, 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 to love you, I have to agree, which we know is a lie. I don't have to agree with you to love you. But as when we get into the, what the media is doing, Sister Dion, your point about rewire, rewiring the brain is key. This is what marketers are doing. And remember I said that Satan is the greatest marketer. Satan, what he does is, is sell you your insecurities. Sorry, no, he creates your insecurities and he sells you the solution. And so ba basically he's trying to take you out of God's image and put you into his image. And so in this whole um, uh, debate and this, this, this whole discussion, what he's doing is using people who people like, as you say, Sister Dion, to, to make this more palatable and more acceptable. I'll give you an example. I always use it. There was a girl called Paris Hilton. She had a sex tape which was used as, a, as promotion for her MTV show. On that TV show was a woman called Kim Kardashian. Kim Kardashian was nobody. She was a dog's body. She was just like carrying Paris Hilton's bags. But once MTV knew that they could sell a TV show with a sex tape, all of a sudden Kim Kardashian has a sex tape released, also followed up by a show. Keep note, on this show, she introduces her family. She introduces her family and then her stepfather goes from Bruce to Caitlyn Jenner. But by the time Bruce goes to Caitlyn Jenner, you've already fell in love with Kim Kardashian and her family. So you can't disagree with Bruce becoming Caitlyn Jenner. And this is how the enemy gets people. He gets people to endorse his foolishness. Yeah. And as you say, Sister Dion, now he's even getting Christians to endorse foolishness because Kanye West married into that family and everybody just believed he was saved. But Kanye West never stood against anything that that family did. But yet people went out and bought his so-called gospel album. And this is why, as you as it goes back to what, what I was saying, everything must stand up and be judged by the word of God. And the media does not belong to God. It belongs to the God of this world, which is Satan, because he's the prince of the power of the air waves. And so what anything we see in the media, we need to know what's the agenda behind it. What are the media trying to, to tell me? This is why I don't really watch news. And if I watch news, if I watch a TV show, I'm always thinking, what is the agenda? Who is presenting this message to me? What is their agenda? What are they trying to get me to believe? What perspective are they trying to get me to have? This is why you'll see in every TV show now, they will throw in some kind of transgender or homosexual agenda. A few years ago, I was watching a TV show called The, 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 the Walking Dead. I got to season five, so I'm very invested. And all of a sudden, they got a gay zombie in there. Or not only a gay zombie, they put a gay character in the show. The show is about the end of the world almost, and people walking around who are dead. But somehow they managed to slip in a gay character. And for me, I'm like, I'm not watching this show no more because what you're trying to do is, is make me in, um, insensitive to the fact that this is wrong and this is a sin and try to make it a part of society. So imagine now what's going to happen in 20 years. Your children 
and I always say this, will turn against you because the schools are educating them to believe that there's 125 million genders. The schools are edu educating them to believe that anybody who is against this agenda is evil. And so what happens if, if we're not careful, if we're not inoculating our children against the foolishness of this world, you're going to have enemies in your own house because your children are going to turn around and call you a bigot. We have to be so careful of the media, even not even just what our children are watching, what we are watching and what we are allowing into our subconscious, because ultimately you are what you eat. Sister Bueller, we're going to end on you because we're three minutes over time. So, yeah, I just wanted to, I'm not trying to do a diversion tactic, but <laughs> sometimes I think um, this issue is a, um, not a red herring, but an easy target because, for example, I mean, if we're honest, we've been watching things like soaps for a long time. Yeah. And in the soaps, they promote, um, I mean, hardcore promote adultery. Yeah. Um, you know, even our sitcoms are always about the sitcoms are always based upon, you know, catastrophic and and um, multiple uh, romantic encounters. Yeah. So it promotes promiscuity, whether it's homosexual or not. Yeah. All these things happen. Um, but we are happy to watch them. Correct. Yeah. So we, we we're very happy to watch them. Now, if you if you're acquainted with like the Disney Channel and Nickelodeon or whatever, there is no, you know, there's shows for like they say the teeny boppers. So mm. the, they say that that's between the seven and thirteen. Let's say there is no show that's not about girlfriend and boyfriend. Yeah, all of the shows are about that. So sometimes I think I'm I'm only, I'm only saying this to say that mm. I. I I'm not trying to cause a diversion, but I just think sometimes that our attention can be, you know, it's, it's so inflammatory. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, if you're going to let your kids watch um, whatever these little dancing programs are or about the horse, whatever, all these little, I don't know, whatever there's on Disney and, and um, yeah. you know, um, to me, this this the standard, it holds it yeah. holds you can't because then guess what and this happens all the time you know you want to um, instill in your in your young people or, or in your in children about um abstinence and about the sanctity of marriage and all these different things and that all they're asking is why can't i have a boyfriend why can't i because it's on tv because it's on mtv there is yeah. not a music video that is not completely drenched it doesn't matter what these fake feminists try to say about claiming about their body and all that stuff. They are naked 99% of the time. And then trying to tell us that it's a, to empower us. Um, so it's already, it's already there. We can focus it on something that we all agree is not correct, but the other things are there. Yes. So, you know, how do you then say, you know, you said you're going to do the family day, I guess, but I'm just saying it to say that these are things that need to be safeguarded against as well that's a fact and it's all about the foring of our moral compass because if you remember back in the 60s and 70s all the shows were about families <laughs> now now you have shows that are all about promise those those stuff wouldn't have been allowed yeah to uh, in the 60s and the 50s and 70s because it wasn't morally okay like marilyn monroe when she came out and all that those type of people they wasn't accepted broadly by everybody like there was still a moral majority in some regards that would fight against a lot of those things but because we have become so accepting of nonsense and and and, and we can bring it right back to gospel music kirk franklin opened the door to all of the nonsense we see now yeah we, we all might have liked stomp but stomp opened the door and before that there's certain other gospel artists who were always uh, bringing secular artists onto their songs like Satan doesn't or doesn't try to blow a hole in everything. He just needs an inch. And Sister K, you said doorway programming, one leads to more. That's exactly how Satan works. The Bible says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. That is it for this week. That's the introduction done. Next week, we're going to start delving into uh, more deeper topics. We're going to go into the garden and see how Satan's plan, yeah, from the beginning and from heaven, was to change our perspective of self, of God's self, 
and the world around us, right? Because he convinced the angels of a different perspective of themselves and God and what was around them. And he did it to Adam and Eve. And we're going to delve into how that works. But Sister Kate, as you uh, commented, can you close us in prayer, please, as we are seven minutes over time? Okay. Father, in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, we thank you, we bless you, we honour you. Thank you for this coming together on this platform, Lord, to look into perspective. I pray, God, that the only perspective we will hold is yours, the one of righteousness and true holiness and love. God, help us to be light and salt to those around us in the kingdom, in the world, God. We thank you for the inspiration for this series. And as it continues, I pray that more souls will be edified and strengthened and educated and encouraged. Help us to take a firmer stand in what we believe. Help us to correct what is wrong. Help us to be open-minded, Lord, to receive truth. Lord God, I pray that all of this will help us to be better and to be more like you. Thank you for Brother Michael and the YAM group and everyone who's come on this evening, every household that's represented. We ask for your blessing in order as we're about to leave one from another. I pray that this program has given us something to think about, something to ponder, to meditate, to take into prayer and something to measure against, measure ourselves against that we can be better. God, we honor you and bless you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you very much.